So today I'll be presenting uh, some work, uh, kind of what I've dedicated my last sort of year, year and a half to, um, which is uh, building a mechanical pollster. Um, and uh, part of this work is joined with Professor Ray Dutch, who's here in the audience uh, as well from uh, Nuffield College. Um, and the main thrust of the presentation is going to be to try to understand how uh, and what convenient digital samples uh, can contribute to, my, to public opinion research um, with the aid of machine learning and, and so on and so forth, and modeling tools and computational statistical tools, etc. Um, now, the talk is going to be uh, divided into two parts. Uh, the first part uh, is going to be quite short, and it's kind of just going to give you um, a sort of broad idea of where we want to go with this uh, and what we think the uh, the ultimate goal of this kind of research should be. Uh, and that is, in my mind, to build a mechanical pollster and what that means and kind of explaining this concept to you all. Um, and then the second part is going to be a little more detail. And, uh, and we're going to be talking about the, the, this paper that I've been working on with Professor Dutch, um, and especially in how we can convert the Twitter API into an online panel using human intelligence, as we will see. So to start with, what does it mean to build a mechanical pollster? Well, first, let's meet the mechanical pollster. Uh, in my mind, he is an artificial intelligence dynamically learning and revealing to the world our behavioral propensities with unprecedented granularity, accuracy, and precision. So the, you can imagine this uh, is just a pollster, but the difference is that it's automatically producing uh, output uh, at the deepest cross tabs in real time, uh, and it's free for everyone. So everybody has access to this information, uh, and it's um, unbiased to the extent that you know uh, any machine is unbiased compared to a human, let's say. Um, and uh, and I believe that this uh, this mechanical poster will come to be in the next ten or fifteen years. And part of the reason is that uh, this fundamental backbone to this mechanical pollster idea is this methodology called MRP, multi-level regression and post certification, which has been making the rounds recently. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. If you're not, don't worry, I'm about to recap it very quickly. Um, the fundamental idea behind the multi-level regression and post certification paradigm is um, that essentially we want to be able to make small area or granular predictions um, from uh, samples that are not representative uh, for the areas that we're interested in making predictions in. So for example, we might want to make predictions at the constituency level in the United Kingdom for the Brexit referendum uh, and kind of estimate the percentage leave in each constituency. And um, I'm gonna take you through how to do that uh, just very briefly so you're familiar with the underlying technology, let's say. So first you have to collect an individual level sample of some sort. This typically comes in the form of either a random digit dial sample or, or an online panel. Second, you have to prepare a stratification frame. So this is uh, a matrix that contains uh, details of um, uh, how many people in each group of interest, here we call it cell, there are in each constituency. So for example, it will contain information such as there are a thousand people from this cell and the cell would be a person aged, people aged between 25 and 34 of black ethnicity, of male sex, of level four education, and so on and so forth. Third, we have to prepare a constituency level predictor. So um, in this case, it would be uh, information about the constituency that would be useful to predict the outcome of interest. Um, so things like for the Brexit referendum, it would be like past vote, um, social demographic information at that constituency level, and so on and so forth. Fourth, we have to actually fit a multi-level regression model. Um, and this is very simple multi-level regression model uh, for the percentage leave um, with a global intercept, some random effects, some fixed effects. The random effects being uh, at the individual level, uh, so things like you'd have an age random effect or a gender random effect or an education random effect. And the fixed effects would typically be things to do with the area predictor that we defined above. Fin fifth, and almost finally, uh, you then make a prediction for each cell in your certification frame based on uh, the model that you trained on your convenient individual level sample. And sixth, you aggregate these uh, predictions according to the counts provided by the certification frame. And ultimately you get to this kind of robust estimate of the area level vote share, a leave vote share uh, for constituencies. 
And this is sort of the result. So this is an image taken from uh, uh, the YouGov predictions that were put out. Uh, this isn't the constituency level. If I remember correctly, this is the potentially the LSOA level or the census tract, I can't remember. But um, nevertheless, it's a small area of analysis. Uh, and uh, the idea behind it was to use their online panel, which is obviously unrepresentative to some degree, um, and uh, use this, this methodology to account for observable selection into that panel and then make these predictions that are then, um, uh, that after post certification are then quite accurate. So I think that this is a very exciting technology, um, not just in the, in the way it is being adopted now, that there is in the future, I think it's gonna have dramatic repercussions to our daily life, but I can already cite at least two examples of disruption um, uh, that we have seen with this early sort of development of this technology. Uh, the first is the Xbox study by Wang et al and Gelman and others, um, where uh, they took a massive amount, uh, a massive sample from online Xbox gamers. So these are people that play like Call of, Call of Duty, for example, and surveyed them uh, in the same way that you would survey a representative population. And what it turned out was that after you apply uh, regression and post-certification, you obtain uh, dynamic estimates of the two-party vote share, which outperform traditional polls in the 2012 election. And this is despite enormous selection effects, uh, uh, you know, mostly male, uh, mostly young, uh, much more uh, third party voters like libertarians and so on and so forth. But the biggest, in my mind, the biggest example of disruption thus far has been the 2017 uh, YouGov election predictions by Lauderdale and others. Um, and the reason why I think they're the biggest example of disruption is not so much because of the accuracy, even though the accuracy was great, is because that it shows what can happen once this technology becomes public domain. And the value of the pound, the day that the Times reported on their predictions and, and first put the predictions out there, dropped by half a percentage point, which suggests to me it's kind of an early example of how disruptive this technology could be if kind of made uh, increased in scale and made available to the world. And just briefly, I want to uh, walk with you to situate this technology. Some people argue that this technology comes from the sort of the area uh, specific kind of political science, public opinion research. But I would argue that actually, uh, even though the, sort of the, this technology has found some use in that field, um, it's actually a product of the marriage between sort of AI research, computational statistics, and sort of the advances that we have seen from that literature. Um, and even though this technology for the application to election forecasting was originally envisioned in 1965, it's no accident that most of the applications to do with technology, with this particular technology have been in the last 10 or 15 years. And it's got to do with the fact that before you couldn't do mass scale, multi-level modeling of the kind that we can right now. And that is the direction that, and, and it is the computational revolution and the AI revolution that is gonna take this technology and move it to the next step, which we see to be the mechanical pollster, this idea of a uh, artificial intelligence revealing to the world propensities and, uh, um, uh, and opinion in real time on a mass scale. That's why we believe that uh, uh, progress in this field comes by way of automation. And there are two things that you can automate. Data collection. So already we have seen examples of paper that uh, have machine-led feature extraction. So no longer you need to survey people. You can trust your deep neural networks to uh, uh, essentially create surveys from um, uh, Twitter, for example. And Twitter is, we will get into this in the next part of the talk, but Twitter is interesting because it has all this information, but the challenge is that this information is completely unstructured. And so you need to structure it into a survey format if you then want to use regression and post-certification. Uh, and that's where the challenge comes in. And also you want to uh, automate modeling choices. So you don't want to feed a specific functional form to your uh, machine because you know, that limits your applications. It limits you, know, you to vote choice, for example. And then if something new comes up that you want to apply this technology to, say COVID infection rates, for example, or the spread of fake news and anything of that sort, you're stuck and you, you, need, to get, uh, uh, you need to find new functional forms and you want this to be automated, essentially. And there have been some examples in the literature of um, uh, the use of machine learning to automate model selection in, uh, in MRP. So just quick recap of the three essential ideas. Idea one is that the mechanical pollster builds on regression and post-certification. 
Idea two is that the adoption and development of this technology builds on advances in computational statistics and kind of the AI revolution more than it does area specific public opinion research. And uh, essentially idea three is that the future lies in automation. Okay, so I feel like now we've set the stage and we can talk about uh, this particular paper, which is uh, converting the Twitter API into a high quality online panel by human intelligence. And the aim of this paper is to answer one specific research question, which is, can the Twitter API or Amazon Mechanical Turk function as a valid high resolution data source for the mechanical pollster? So we're trying to find the source here. We're trying to find something that we can start building on in order to have these dynamic estimates of whatever you want uh, uh, to come to life. And the research strategy that we use is to test the performance of MRP and by extension, the mechanical pollster on 2020 voting intention at the state level in the US. First varying data sources, so kind of testing out how the mechanical pollster would do if it only uses Twitter data, if it only uses mechanical Turk data, if it uses random digit dial polls, and then changing modeling approaches. So sort of going from the traditional multi-level regression to multi-level regression with structured priors, to ridge regression, to more gradient, tree gradient boosting through XG boost, and so on and so forth. And I want to, before we get bugged down by all the details, which are many, I want to present to you some of the preliminary results. Um, and let me just quickly tell you what this panel is about. Uh, on the x-axis of each plot, you find a predicted share of the Republican vote. On the y-axis is the uh, observed share of the Republican vote at the state level. Um, and on the top left panel, you find the digital MRP, which is a MRP with uh, um, uh, some structured priors applied to a data set of both sort of a joint data set of both Twitter and Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. On the top right is the same model, but applied only to Twitter uh, users. On the bottom left is the same model, but applied only to Turk users. And on the bottom right is the RDD, random digit dial, the performance of the traditional MRP on the random digit dial polls for the United States. And what you can see here, which I think it's interesting is that the with this version of the model, which again, it's preliminary and it's still early days and we want to improve, et cetera. But with this version of the model, the Twitter data seems viable to some degree. It seems that the correlation is quite high. The mean absolute error from the truth is reasonably contained or at least comparable to what you would get from rad random digit dial polls. Um, but obviously it has some real problems. Um, and you can see that especially for sort of some of them uh, just Republican leaning states, it has a real bias against the Republicans. And that's kind of coming from Twitter sentiment being, you know, these unobservable selection effects that maybe we can do something about. Um, but it's interesting because similarly, random digit dial polls in this election and like in the past uh, three, uh, three out of four last election cycles in the US, have had selection effects against the Republicans as well. And you can see it in the random digit dial polls in that they underestimate the uh, vote share of the Republican quite consistently across states. And so what we can take out of this, I think, is that uh, obviously this still needs more work, but in principle, twit this way that we're gonna explain on extracting information about Twitter users and then post-stratifying after modeling is viable. And it is potentially viable. Uh, uh, this means that essentially the mechanical pollster can use it as its source. And so we can start, we can move on to the next step in my mind, which is now that we have shown that we can label uh, uh, Twitter accounts accurately. And we've shown that these labels are significant because we can recover accurate estimates of the vote share. Now we can move on to say, okay, can we now automate this process and doing it on a much bigger scale, essentially. Okay. so. Let's get back into the paper motivation a little bit. And the question here is, okay, but why are we doing all this? Why are we not happy with the current status quo of public opinion research that we want to find different alternative automated ways to do public opinion research? And one of the reasons lies in the tragedy of what response rates have been to uh, public opinion polls for the past sort of 20 years, um, which has seen response rate dropping all the way down to 6% and even lower. Uh, in 2018. Um, and, uh, you know, you might say, oh, but I've seen papers and there are very important papers that show that accuracy of um, uh, public opinion polls has not decreased dramatically over the past 20, 30 years. 
Well, but I would argue that it's starting to. And one of the initial um, findings that this is the case was in the 2016 election, where um, the failure from pollsters to account for, um, for education in, their, uh, in, in people who selected into answering their uh, random digit dial poll um, led to a pretty bad, um, uh, you know, led to the wrong call, essentially pollsters making the wrong call in key swing states in the United States in 2016. And you can see from this table, which comes from the Kennedy report about the failures of public opinion polling in 2016, that compared to the CPS current population survey benchmark in each state, the main pollsters all overestimated the percentage of people who had a college degree in their sample. And that obviously leads, you know, college degree is a very strong predictor of vote choice. And in particular, it was in 2016 and it was again in 2020. And so it's no, it's no question that this is happening. So then the question becomes, okay, well, given that even random digit dials are really unrepresentative samples, why don't we move towards a model-based approach for public opinion polling, which is what we're arguing here. The challenge, however, is that if we, if we want to replace public opinion polling with digital data, and especially I'm thinking Twitter, I'm thinking Amazon Mechanical Turks, um, we need to be able to extract signal from this digital data, which as I said, it's often even more unrepresentative than the polls and more unstructured. But there have been early, example of being, early examples of papers that have been able to do this. So for example, in a previous paper with Professor Dutch, we showed that individual level behavior, um, partisan behavior uh, in real life converts to partisan behavior in uh, uh, online. And so we showed that, for example, commenting positively on the Facebook profile of a politician in the United States correlated very strongly 0.9 some with um, at, at the individual level attending like a partisan primary, for example, or um, being a registered voter from the party of which the politician is from. And not only that, but we are not the only ones who've shown something similar. Barbera in 2015 showed that you can use social networks to reveal people's partisan identity on Twitter. So depending on who you follow on Twitter, that gives big cues as to your partisanship. And Wang and others have shown that you can extract demographic information such as age and gender and location from Twitter using uh, convolutional neural networks. And um, although this, this last part here is perhaps the most difficult uh, of, the, uh, of the things that we're trying to measure, um, and accuracy is currently not, uh, not particularly high, um, we believe that advances in, uh, in sort of computer vision uh, are gonna deal with this problem uh, as we move forward with this technology. So I've been talking about this Twitter API and I wanna list some of the opportunities that the Twi Twitter API poses and some of the challenges. The opportunities for the mechanical pollsters are that there is almost no other source that is as high frequency as the Twitter API. You can access data in real time of millions of users um, and it is free for, for academics in fact. So just recently Twitter actually made their historical data available to academics. Uh, and you can just sign up and uh, after a quick background check, if you're an academic, uh, you can get access to that. And it is relatively low cost per observation in the private sector. So even if this technology was adopted by the private sector, it would still be viable to use Twitter. Hence, it's, it's very important to, to start with Twitter, I think, as a case study for uh, this kind of technology. And it is massively rich in user characteristics. But, but we will talk about that. It has loads of user characteristics, but remember they are unstructured. And finally, it poses a lower ethical risk in some sense compared to like Facebook or Instagram, where people are more likely to express kind of personal and, uh, 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 and um, other kinds of uh, uh, information that you wouldn't want to be in the public domain. Whereas for Twitter, because the nature of the, uh, uh, of the social network is so overtly uh, public, you have, uh, as a researcher, I have less ethical concerns when dealing with uh, Twitter data than I do, for example, Facebook data. The challenges are that it is massively unrepresentative. And it's not just unrepresentative of the population at large, but it's actually unrepresentative of the Twitter population it's, itself. So some studies have shown that the Twitter API, random samples provided to you by the Twitter API, are actually unrepresentative of true random samples of, of true, the true population of Twitter users. 
And so there is, you know, we think we can solve this, at least to some degree, with the regular, regularized prediction and post certification or regression and post certification framework, um, insofar as we can observe as many as possible of these selection effects. And then the, the other problem, which is massive, is that it is an unstructured data set. And that's where the, the Amazon Mechanical Turks come in for us, because we're going to use them and they're going to work with us to try to turn this unstructured flood of data into a survey, essentially, which we can then analyze with typical survey tools. And finally, we do have to note that if we use this as the backbone of the mechanical pollster, the Twitter regulatory framework is evolving dramatically, especially uh, recently, but it has been for the past 10 years. And there is a long-term risk of bias being introduced if selection effects into the um, the uh, into Twitter affected by regulation uh, become correlated with outcomes of interest. So, for example, if it is the case that extreme and hate speech, extreme views and hate speech are banned from Twitter, we're going to get less uh, of this voting block um, in Twitter, uh, and so it becomes problematic from the purpose from the point of view of public opinion research. So, what do we mean by harnessing human intelligence to turn? Twitter, the Twitter API into an online panel. First of all, we're not referring to uh, IQ here. This is not intelligence in that sense. It's a broad use of the term intelligence. Just the ability of being able to uh, correctly identify whether an individual has a certain characteristic based on their Twitter information. And so, um, and I will show you now with the survey instrument how exactly what kind of information is passed on to the Mechanical Turks and um, what they can do with that information. And this is kind of an extension of the wisdom of the crowd principle in that insofar as the Turks have, uh, uh, are like rational in expectation and biased only in observable ways, then we can take their predictions about, we can take an average of their predictions about an, any individual on Twitter and assume that that, uh, and that is gonna be quite highly correlated with the truth, essentially. It's gonna be a good prediction. Um, and in the long term, I think part of our work is going to be in identifying kind of like a panel of mechanical Turks or a panel of super predictors um, that can be trained and, uh, and can learn from their own mistakes uh, uh, in order to best uh, do this job of transforming the Twitter API into an online panel. Um, the opportunities with working with mechanical Turks are that it is a high skill subject pool. And you can survey them at the same time as they're doing this work for you. So essentially, for you get two. Uh, of course, you you still have to pay uh, reasonably to these individuals. Otherwise, they're not going to work with you. Um, but in principle, you can get two subjects for the price of one. And um, the platform also allows you to screen for very relevant demographics. So we needed US only mechanical Turks, and we were able to screen for those in the mechanical Turk platform. The challenges are that it's full of bots, random clicker, VPN workers who you cannot trust the uh, demographic information that you have from. And therefore you need to implement uh, attention checks uh, and other different kinds of uh, uh, checks in your survey instruments in order to make sure that your data is clean. Um, and also they have kind of a hive mind and this is kind of a joke, but you know, uh, all you have on the Mechanical Turk platform is your reputation. And if for some reason you screw, uh, you make a mistake and you get into hot waters with one of the mechanical Turks, none of them will want to work with you. And so it's very important that you, when you work with mechanical Turks, you uh, sort of, you treat them right, you engage in communications with them. And um, it's kind of a two-way street really um, uh, in the, on this platform. So, uh, I will show you what the survey instrument that we use looks in a minute. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the data collection and data wrangling in general. So if you remember back to what I explained about multi-level regression and post-certification, just a recap, there are two data elements to it. One is the stratification frame, and another is the individual level data. And so we start with dealing with the stratification frame in our analysis. And so our certification frame was provided to us by a pollster in the United States called Optimus Analytics. And it is based on voter registration files. Uh, and voter registration files are this mix of commercial, modeled, and public data that tell you about individual voters. But we didn't care about individual voters uh, from the voter registration files. We only wanted cells that we could post stratify against. And so this is what we obtained from them. We obtained from them um, a sort of summary of their voter registration file 
uh, a summary made of 16 million plus cells, um, uh, uh, each having sort of n being the number of people within that cell. And um, now you will see here that some of them have missing values. And this is actually uh, a big challenge that we face here because these missing values are not in reality missing at random. Um, they, uh, there have been regulation, for example, in Wisconsin, that um, you, uh, you're no longer required to register with your, real, with your age uh, when you register to vote. And so in Wisconsin, we're having these missing values that are correlated with age. So young people, for example, are much more likely uh, to not have uh, an age record attached with them. Um, and then other problematic missing values are here with the preference for 2016, where um, this is a modeled uh, quantity, modeled based on the surveys available to the pollster. And uh, those having NA are people who could not, the pollster was undecided whether they would have voted Trump or Clinton in 2016. And so again, this is a kind of a difficult multiple imputation problem. So how can we approach this? Well, first of all, I've explained to you what the problems are with these missing values. And the other problem is that really, if you want to do any sort of multiple imputation on this, uh, 16 million cells defined by 14 categorical variables, which, you know, if you expand them, if you kind of one hot encode them, you end up with like 500 variables or sorts. Um, this is not something that your laptop is going to be able to do very easily. Um, and uh, so we have to come up with also a solution to how to deal with this big data problem, let's say. By the way, note that these problems, even though we obtain the stratification frames from Optimus Analytics, these problems are general. Whenever you have a stratification frame in a, uh, a MRP application, you are going to have to do some multiple imputation uh, uh, and you're going to have to deal with uh, the data, the size of the data set. So we hope that our application can sort of be inspiring to others who are uh, dealing with similar problems with MRP. So the solutions we proposed are, first, we take an individual level sample from the original stratification frame. We make sure that this sample is large enough to preserve at least the key marginals. And this kind of allows you to make meaningful uh, multiple imputation models, because now the imputation is at the individual level, and you can correctly account for individual level uncertainty. Whereas if you had the cells only, if you were imputing, for example, uh, the value of one cell, you'd turn all of that cell into the imputed, uh, the new imputed cell. Whereas in this way, we're only turning individuals and we're preserving individual level uncertainty. And the other uh, advantage of taking a random sample is that it decreases the certification frame size. And so once we have done these two things, we can then apply multiple imputation with chained equations and use random forest to do the actual modeling in the back. The idea here being that we don't have to pre-specify a model uh, or a functional form for any of these um, missing values. Uh, and we can rely entirely on the sort of machine learning backbone to find the optimal, um, uh, the optimal most predictive uh, um, missing values. Um, and also random forest solves the scaling issue because random forest can be run in parallel uh, and uh, there have been created packages that um, uh, are very efficient uh, with the use of uh, sort of computational time um, to run random forests. The last thing I want to say about this is that, uh, again, still 10 million, let's say we, we take a subsample of 10 million individuals um, out of the uh, 16 million cells, right? This is still pretty big to do a, a multiple imputation model on. And so there is this nice package called Nice Ranger that allows you to train your multiple imputation model on a subset of this data and fit it on the whole 10 million data set. And that's what we do here. I have some backup slides that show you kind of uh, how reliable our imputation is, and we can get into it if you want in the later discussion, but I'm gonna leave it here for now. This is the result that you get. So I have re-aggregated the 10 million individual imputed, sort of multiply imputed 10 million individual level um, data set and re-aggregated it up to cells. And now there are no more missing values. And assuming that our uh, imputation model was reasonable, our certification frame, result certification frame is also gonna be reasonable. Then, now we're gonna get into the gathering survey-like data from Twitter using the Amazon Mechanical Turks, as I described. And first things first, if you want to do this, you have to go through the ethics review. There, uh, this is a complicated ethical process. You're dealing with people's sort of individual level information, even though it's public, uh, you need to make sure that um, uh, you have covered your, sort of, you, cover your T's and dotted your I's, um, cross your T's and dotted your I's. Um, 
the second, after you've done your uh, uh, ethics review, the second thing you need to do is first you need to assemble a corpus of tweets. Uh, we assembled a corpus of tweets from August 1st to November, November 3rd, which was the day of the election, from the Twitter streaming API. Uh, and these amounted to around 3 million tweets, maybe a little more. And since October 1st, we started sending the data to the Turks for deduction. So to kind of get them to tell us, hey, is this guy, uh, can we classify this guy as male or female? Can we classify it as a college graduate or not? Can we classify it um, uh, uh, as somebody who lives in California or somewhere else? And so on and so forth. And um, every day we fed between 100 and 400 unique random Twitter users from our big corpus who tweeted over 10 times over the period. Now, upon reflection, this, this constraint that people sh must have had to tweet over 10 times in order to be in our sample, I've come to think of it as a restriction, which is adding more selection bias into our sample. Because obviously, you're going to be more likely to capture people who, are, who have high interest in politics. And so that kind of biases your sample a little bit. So in future iterations of this work, I think we're going to change that uh, for the second part of the data collection. And, um, and then finally, we show these, these accounts to the Turkers and obtain information about the users and workers. Uh, we also constrain it so that workers cannot do more than one human intelligence task hit per day. And uh, we iteratively settled on a paper hit of 1.25 US dollars. Um, and that made the cost per predicted likely voter about 1.7 US dollars. And so this is the sort of survey instrument that Mechanical Turks would have seen. So they would have seen kind of the information that comes from somebody's Twitter account. So, um, you know, this person, for example, um, if you start read, going through her tweets, which are public, of course, um, she doesn't like Trump, uh, and it's fairly obvious from uh, her set of tweets. But there are also some really interesting information here. For example, that she says, don't blame me for, for the evangelicals. So that might suggest that actually uh, she is an evangelical, but she doesn't like Trump, which is a really interesting subset of, um, uh, of voters that we might be interested in. So this is a rich data set. We just need to turn it into something usable. Uh, we do so. So we ask the Mechanical Turks to kind of fill the gaps for us. And this is what the result is the, at the top here. So you can see that um, when the column source says Twitter, this is an account that was deducted by the Mechanical Turks. And when it says Turks, it's an account. It's just the information from the Mechanical Turk answering the survey him, him or herself. Um, and what we can see from here is that it doesn't look any different from any survey uh, that you might have. We also have some extra um, uh, uh, columns here that because we want to know, for example, how likely is this account to be a bot and how likely is it to be an organization? How likely is it to be spreading fake news? So these are the sort of information that you can gather if you ask Mechanical Turks to make a judgment about Twitter accounts. And in total, we end up having about 4,300 Twitter accounts. But after we exclude third party voters and non likely voters, we end up with less than half of that actually. Uh, and there's a reason for this, which is that Mechanical Turks are really undecided about whether people are going to turn out or not. Uh, it's very interesting because they're undecided about whether they're going to turn out in this election, but they have very little doubt as to whether they turned out in past elections. It's kind of a, a principle of radical uncertainty once they're put in, in, the, in the question of uh, making a prediction about people's likelihood of turning out this election as opposed to previous elections. Um, we also end up having, oh, sorry. We also end up having around 4,000 uh, Mechanical Turks, and uh, which become about 3,000 once you exclude third-party voters and non-likely voters. And finally, we also collect a random digit dial sample uh, worth 11,000 individuals. Um, and these, are, these were collected, we use this for benchmarking purposes. And these were collected from the, uh, you can collect this data from the Roper Center uh, for Public Opinion. And uh, they are uh, an agglomeration of all the Washington Post and ABC News polls from September and October, uh, dealing with swing states, and the Kaiser Foundation polls, which are nationally representative. So kind of, we have a mix of two different uh, uh, types of random digit dial polls in our random digit dial sample. Okay, so a quick exploration of how these data look compared to the population. So when it comes to states, obviously the random digit dial polls are weirder in the sense that they way oversample um, uh, swing state voters, but that's baked in the cake. This, this is, was the reason why these polls were run. Um, they had more swing states voters. But when it comes to Twitter and Turks, actually it's, it's pretty reasonable. Um, the spread across states seems to be pretty reasonable. Um, when it comes to gender, 
all of our uh, samples are more male than female, especially so Twitter. Again, uh, this is confirmed, uh, sort of confirms other literature on the topic. Um, and that's awkward because in the population at large, females are more than men. Um, so there is a clear selection effect here. Um, ethnicity, our sample, uh, Twitter sample is more white and so are the random digit dial and the Turk samples. But um, uh, apart from this over sampling of white uh, individuals on Twitter, which is particularly severe, um, the, the, the rest of the distribution doesn't seem so skewed. Uh, when it comes to age, there's a big problem, as you might expect, um, in that uh, uh, whilst the random digit dial sample is skewed towards elderly people, which are the ones that are more likely to pick up the phone when you call them, um, the Turks uh, and Twitter are both skewed towards way younger people, so kind of between 25 and 34, um, and kind of the, we really struggle actually to find elderly Twitter and Turk users, and this is a big challenge for us actually. Um, when it comes to college degree, um, again, uh, so registered voters are mostly non-college degree, but unsurprisingly, Twitter and Turks both uh, heavily overrepresent degree holders. Um, random digit dial polls don't, but in part, uh, that might be because they're dealing with swing states, and swing states tend to be in the Rust Belt, where it's not as common to uh, hold a college degree. Um, and so you might have, you know, this might not look like a massive overestimation, but actually, if you were to, to think about it in terms of national representativeness, it very well might be, even in the random digit dial samples. Um, when it comes to income, uh, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, the random digit dial polls do the best at kind of approximating the, the true distribution of income in the population, um, whereas Twitter and Turks both kind of overrepresent middle to lower income uh, uh, people. Uh, when it comes to marital status, this shouldn't say single, by the way. This should be married and non-married, but uh, this is a over, I overlooked that. Um, but yeah, uh, whilst Turks are kind of representative of the registered voters, um, uh, uh, you know, th there isn't too much of a bias here. It's quite sick. There is quite a bit in Twitter um, in that more married people seem to be on Twitter. Um, which is interesting, I need to think about that. But uh, overall, there isn't much to see here, I don't think. When it comes to party identification, this is the most severe in my mind because it's correlated with our outcome of interest. And um, you know, compared to registered voters, which are mostly, uh, a there is a little bit of a Democrat advantage, um, uh, but you know, both Twitter and Turks massively oversample Democrats, uh, and that's, that's a problem. Um, and uh, when it comes to 2016 vote, um, uh, oh, I, I have an error in this slide. You can ignore it. But essentially, it, it, the, the, the error in 2016 vote is in the same direction as um, this slide. So more Clinton voters in Twitter and Mechanical Turks. Uh, and when it comes to turnout 2020, here you can see the evidence for what I was telling you before, which is that uh, almost exactly 50-50 split uh, in Twitter uh, uh, predicted turnout, which suggests that the, the Turkers really don't know if people are going to turn out. But what's interesting is that they are pretty certain about whether people turned out in 2016 and 2018. Um, uh, uh, and, and there they overrepresent people who turn out, uh, which is not uncommon. Again, if you see the random digit dial samples do very similar thing here. OK. so. We have, we have a certification frame. We're almost there. We have a certification frame. We have our individual level data. And now we want to augment both with some uh, aggregate level characteristics. So at the area and time level. So we might use like area level social demographics, uh, area level past vote, um, area and time kind of level uh, economics, such as like percentage unemployed, which goes by month, uh, GDP growth, et cetera. Uh, and then obviously this year, we have to account for something to do with COVID. And so we had to account for uh, the cumulative number of COVID cases and deaths. Uh, obviously, we also interacted a lot of these variables, but there's no time to go into details on that. So feel free to ask me uh, later on in the Q&A sessions. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the modeling, and then let's go back to the results. So some general considerations about modeling, which I'll quickly skim through. Um, so first of all, traditional MRP applications use multilevel regression because of its ability to regularize. And um, this is particularly useful if the data that you have is unrepresentative um, because, uh, uh, or rather it's unrepresentative of certain sub units 
For example, if your data set is at the national level, you might not have any observations from uh, uh, some of the subunits of interest. And therefore, um, using the global mean uh, uh, to impute those uh, subnational uh, units kind of makes sense. And that's what regularization is doing to, to some degree. Um, and uh, yeah, um, the, the advantage of multilateral regression has always been that it has been relatively easy to estimate in a Bayesian framework if your sample sizes are moderate. Now, as we expand and go into really big sample sizes, this creates huge problems. And this is some of the limitations that I want to outline for this methodology. So, you know, um, first of all, you have to fine tune your model specification. And we kind of talked about this. Ideally, we would like automated model specification to come to be. Um, secondly, too much regularization can lead to attenuation bias. And that's very common in uh, MRP applications. Uh, and that's partly because the, with respect to some of these new machine learning tools, multilevel regression is a relatively blunt tool to control the bias variance trade-off. And finally, uh, yeah, Bayesian multinomial models like you have in the UK, for example, you, you, what, like you have to use in the UK and other multi-party systems, um, just do not support um, uh, large, um, uh, large N, essentially. Um, so current solutions are to use some of these machine learning tools uh, for sparse MRP. Um, uh, and these have been sort of like sparse MRP, tree ensembles, um, uh, but these have not yet convinced the major players in commercial MRP applications. Um, and finally, uh, you can relax shrinkage, uh, uh, sort of again, thinking about this bias variance trade-off um, uh, by introducing a substantial area level predictor and local smoothing as well. Um, and we can do so reasonably computationally expediently with STAN, uh, which uses a version of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, uh, and provides much faster fitting time than JAGS, for example. Um, and you can also ask it to live dangerously uh, and be a little more superficial in exploring the posterior. Um, uh, but still, this tends to be a little slow for a large N. Okay, so I'm quickly going to go through the models that we used and then uh, get back to the results and then we're done. So um, when we talk about the sort of modeling strategy, there are three main approaches that we want to test. Um, the third one, I actually haven't been able to produce results for yet, but it will be in the near future. Um, so uh, first we have MRP with structured priors. Um, this is simply your multi-level, run-of-the-mill multi-level regression, but it's using, uh, uh, you know, like um, conditionally autoregressive prior on the state level uh, effects and um, temporary color, color, uh, like random walk priors for your temporal effects and so on and so forth. Um, then a model that I thought would have been favorable to non-probability sample because of the idea that, you know, the more shrinkage we do when we have non-probability samples, the better we might be is this kind of ridge regression. Um, and finally, uh, this machine learning with XG boost, which are these gradient boosted trees, um, uh, which are scalable and assumption free, uh, assumption free. So, um, um, again, quick uh, uh, formula for the various models. So this is your MRP with structured priors, a global intercept, uh, a time component, which has a random walk prior, a state component, which has a uh, conditionally autoregressive prior, an intrinsic conditional autoregressive prior, um, some random effects and some uh, fixed effects of the sort that we described earlier. Uh, this, by the way, the type of conditional or aggressive prior we're using is the BYM2, uh, which allows for islands. So uh, Hawaii and uh, Alaska are not affected by uh, pooling, whereas um, uh, all the sort of mainland United States are. Um, the ridge regression approach we use is we, we keep for now this time component, although I might change that in the future. But essentially, we just uh, uh, use a single variance parameter um, to shrink all of the other coefficients uh, uh, um, accordingly. Uh, and by the way, so here essentially ridge regression typically requires you to specify a penalty term or at least to estimate that penalty term from the data. But here we just set it to one because we don't want it to be estimated by the data given that the data is subject to selection effects. And we, we, are, we are kind of happy with the level of um, shrinkage provided by random effects estimators, which is essentially a ridge, ridge estimator without with lambda set equal to one. Um, and then XG boost, but actually I'm gonna skip the XG boost slide because I'm not gonna to present to you XG boost uh, results today. So 
Let's look at the results. So these are our benchmarks. This is in the days when the mechanical pollster is, uh, you know, at the at its fullest, uh, it will be able to uh, outperform 538, for example. But 538, uh, if you're not aware of them, they are uh, an output which makes political predictions in the United States. And um, uh, the, uh, you know, they, they encompass hundreds of polls, right? So these are, this is like a very complicated and sophisticated polling average, which encompasses responses from hundreds of thousands of individuals in the United States. So, you know, with our mere 2000 Twitter users, we are hardly going to be able to uh, challenge that. And yet we don't do so badly uh, at the moment. And then the uniform string model is a political science model that performs quite well. Uh, and so it's a useful benchmark to see, um, uh, to see how well our models perform. Uh, and again, you've seen the slide before, um, and uh, I'm not going to repeat myself, but essentially I'm encouraged by this. There is still quite a lot of work to do because the error rates are not where we want them to be. We want them to be much lower, um, and we think they can be, um, and we can talk about uh, how I can make them better uh, if you want in the Q&A session. Um, and uh, the ridge regression results were not very good. And part of the reason, and this seems obvious to me now, but that I'm looking at the results, but part of the reason is that by shrinking all the predictors, essentially what I did was I encouraged shrinkage on the uh, bias um, and selected global mean of these samples. And so what happened here is that uh, Ridge is doing exactly what you expect it to do, so it's shrinking around the global mean, but the global mean is biased, so the results are worse. Um, so there are ways in which I think uh, this can be remedied in future applications. Um, so briefly, uh, this is still at the early stage of research, uh, still half of the data collection to do. Uh, sample sizes we dealt with were very small. Um, there is more work to be done for a, a sustainable tuning strategy for XGBoost, which is why I haven't been able to present to you my XGBoost results because I've been fighting with the uh, tuning uh, these models uh, and it's non-trivial, um, uh, which maybe you know tips the balance a little bit in favor of slow but easy to fit um, uh, multi-level regression models. Uh, measurement error is a problem. So how many of these predictions made by Mechanical Turks are wrong? And can we do something about that to at least account for it? And can we find, um, uh, and then we have some, uh, some measurement error also in the nationally representative surveys because they come from two different um, uh, polling companies, let's say, and therefore it's quite difficult um, uh, to match them perfectly. Um, imputation, again, we want to compare misrangers uh, against marginals. And so we want to compare sort of the accuracy of our imputations in the certification claim. And finally, um, we want to measure performance beyond the vote. So forget about the vote. Uh, we want to see, you know, uh, percentage of people spreading fake news and so on and so forth. So uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to answering any questions that you might have.